Films in Focus with David Sterrett is underwritten by The Movie House, your destination for first-run Hollywood and independent movies, and a digital portal to the Met Opera, National Theater Live, and special events worldwide in Millerton, New York, and on the web, themoviehouse.net. David Sterrett is the editor-in-chief of the Quarterly Review of Film and Video, contributing writer at Cineast, film professor at the Maryland Institute College of Art, and Robin Hood Radio's very own critic. We are lucky to have him. He joins us weekly. The film's... Leaving Neverland, The Wild Pear Tree, and The Image Book. Again, a sentence. Hi, David. How are you? (laughs) Doing okay, Joe. How are you doing this week? Fine. As I leave Neverland, watching The Wild Pear Tree, taking photos for The Image Book. Yeah. (laughs) Well, very well done. You've you've woven these three totally different films into a a seamless... uh, (laughs) A seamless sentence. Yeah. Well, of these three films, the one which is sort of uh, the easiest for people to see, because the Wild Pear Tree and the Image Book will not be playing in multiplexes. <laughs> Near uh, you. But Leaving Neverland uh, is is everywhere because it's just about to, to air on HBO, uh, uh, just not too long after we record this. Uh, however, it's a real movie. It, uh, it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival earlier this year. Uh, and it's quite a piece of work, I must say. Uh, it's two hours long. It's airing uh, on HBO over two two evenings. Uh, but it's, uh, it's just, it, it's an amazing piece of work, uh, directed by one Dan Reed and it is a documentary. And as the title may suggest, uh, if it doesn't make you think of Peter Pan, it will make you think of Michael Jackson leaving Neverland, uh, because of course that was the name of his estate that he had. And this is a movie which is very much about the late Michael Jackson, but it is very specifically about two young men who, when they were boys, were sexually abused by Michael Jackson over a period of years. Now, Michael Jackson's uh, sins uh, are, are, are pretty public. Uh, all of this came out before he died. Uh, but what we have in this movie is a very thoughtful uh, journey back into this, this sort of horrifying episode or series of episodes uh, through the recollections of these two young men uh, who are the main subjects of the movie. This four-hour-long movie contains a lot of material. It contains some archival footage. It contains various talking heads. But the bulk of it is long interviews with these two young men who were abused by Michael Jackson some years ago. And also the secondary figures in this documentary are their mothers who allowed this to happen, not not willingly allowed it to happen, but whose obtuseness whose inability to see past the charisma of Michael Jackson to what was actually going on is kind of staggering. And it staggers even them in retrospect. It's, there's a lot of, of, this movie has a great deal of, how could I not have seen? How could I have overlooked? How could I have been so dazzled by his celebrity as to not realize what was actually going on? Uh, in fact, Michael Jackson spent a great deal of time in bed with each of these boys. In turn, they were separate incidents, uh, with the mothers not that terribly far away, th- thinking he just loves children so much. He's such a good man, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the horrifying stuff that this movie is about. What impressed me about this movie more than anything else is how calm it is and how thoughtful it is. Again, there's a great deal of very lengthy interview material with these two young men, and they are not overwhelmed by emotion in thinking about all of this. They've had time to absorb this, to come to terms with it to a large extent. Uh, They both recognize, and again, these are separate interviews with these two young young men who, when they were boys, had separate affairs with Michael Jackson, or he had separate affairs with them. Uh, So they're not directly connected in in, in any way. Uh, But uh, in both cases, uh, they are able to look back to acknowledge that they were really in love with Michael Jackson during this episode. He made them in love with him. Uh, And they enjoyed what they were doing and thought it was wonderful what they were doing. And they were willing not to give away the secret uh, because he instructed them not to. And he gave them all sorts of of of, of instructions on how not to. Uh, So, again, that is the material that we get into at great length uh, and with really quite a lot of insight in this movie. And again, what's really striking is how calm and thoughtful these young men are. Yes, uh, these episodes with Michael Jackson had uh, effects on them later on. Uh, and uh, disturbed them, although both turned into successful married adults. 
but uh, the movie is just, I got to say it once again, very thoughtful and very calm in its analysis of what went on. And it's allowing in its four hour length, these young men and their mothers to reflect on what went on, uh, especially the mothers to recriminate with themselves over how they could have allowed this stuff to go on. There's also glances toward other affairs that Michael Jackson had with other children. There's some account of how Michael Jackson went to a very steep decline near the end of his rather short life. Uh, there's not really anything in it about the nature of his death, which I think there really should have been. Uh, that's a whole other story. I guess the film just didn't feel it wanted to get into that as well as the other stuff that it's mainly dealing with. But this is a story of celebrity, about the power of celebrity, about the power of wealth and celebrity in our society, uh, and about the tragic uh, effects that this had on the lives of these particular two boys who are now men. Uh, but I got to say, yet again, it's just a thoughtful, probing movie, and I really recommend it for anybody who wants to think about not only uh, the horrors of pedophilia, but a, a word, which, by the way, which is used exactly once, if I recall correctly, in this whole four-hour movie, but very much about the power of wealth and celebrity and how we let it dazzle us and blind us to things that are really going on. Leaving Neverland is really an extraordinary documentary. And a year from now, I'll be very surprised if it's not on my list of the of the ten of the, the, the this year's ten best movies. Moving to something very different, The Wild Pear Tree is a movie by the very major and great Turkish filmmaker, Nuri Bilge Ceylan. And uh, it is a long movie also. Uh, it's over three hours long. Uh, and again, it's not going to be playing at every multiplex, but it's really worth calling attention to because it's worth seeking out if you're interested in thoughtful dramas. Uh, it's sort of, sort of a film of the mind rather than a film of, of sensation or action or, or even psychology in the usual sense, although it is very much a psychological drama in certain ways. So it's about a young man who is coming back to the hometown where he, uh, once he went off to college, he's now back uh, from college, he's graduated and he wants to be a writer. And he has been, uh, he, has, he has completed a book, which is sort of hard for him to describe because it's sort of an experimental book. Uh, and he, uh, he wants to go off in directions that other writers have not gone off into. And now he's back in his hometown and he's looking for a publisher for this book. And he's having trouble finding one, which is not too surprising. He is an unknown writer, a very beginning writer. His book is not the stuff of bestsellers. Uh, that's quite clear from all the things he says about it. Uh, he wants to sort of do something new in the way of the, the art of writing. Uh, and, uh, and he's having a hard time. Uh, on top of that, there's some sort of family troubles. His father is an irresponsible sort who is separated from his mother, or he does separate from his mother over the course of the movie. Uh, and his father has some, some difficulties uh, with gambling and things like that, uh, and uh, has been uh, digging a well, for one thing. That's one of the little themes of the movie. As the young man tries to uh, get his novel published, the old man is digging a well and having a lot of trouble digging the well and needs other people to help him dig the well, just as the young man needs other help to get his novel published. And so there's interplay between the two of them. And there's various encounters that our main character has over the course of the movie. His name is Sinan. And uh, at one point, he has a long dialogue with a young woman, very attractive young woman. And you think, okay, now this is going to be, this is early in the movie. There's going to be a romance here. That's one of the things the movie's going to be about. But you know, it never turns into that. It just turns out to be a dialogue about what it's like to be young, what it's like to be looking for a way in the world. The young woman is thinking about getting married or not getting married, just as the young man is wondering what will happen if and when he gets his novel published. Uh, much later on, there's a confrontation or, you know, an encounter between our main heroes, uh, uh, Sinan, uh, and an older writer who's actually had some success in getting his works published. And he wants to talk with Sinan and he sort of wants to help, but Sinan is sort of insufferable. He's sort of full of himself and he sort of alienates the older writer who actually might be able to give him some help. So that's basically what this movie is. It's a series of encounters between this young man and his quest to find a publisher for his novel, to come to terms with his family, to come to terms with the town where he grew up. Uh, but it's mainly just this series of encounters, one after another, and it does not come to any kind of definitive resolution at the end. What we see is sort of the odyssey of a young man through a very limited time and place, 
movie takes place over a pretty brief period of time, and it all play, takes place, mostly takes place within this town. There's a little bit of travel outside. And mainly what we have are kind of human encounters, and we get to understand these different personalities just a little bit, and we get to kind of just live with them, to dwell with our main character, Sinan, and experience some of his life vicariously as he has encounters with these various people. So again, it's a very discursive movie. It's full of conversation. It moves along at a pretty slow pace. I don't think it's a great movie, but it's an absorbing movie. And if you want a film that will sort of draw you in and just allow you to explore different personalities at leisure who sort of come and go over the course of more than three hours, uh, that's the kind of movie this is. And if you're in the mood for that kind of thing, I think you will have a meaningful experience. Again, I don't think it's a great movie. I do think that Nuri Bilga Jalan is an important filmmaker. Uh, and this is an important film, although maybe not the, the film which he will someday make, which will be truly great. And finally, the image book. The image book is by one of the very, very greatest of all filmmakers now living, and in some ways, one of the greatest filmmakers who has ever lived, Jean-Luc Godard, the great French-Swiss filmmaker who has made going on 50 feature films and uncountable number of short films over the years. He is about 90 years old now. He's really old. He's the last one of the original French New Wave filmmakers who came of age in the 1950s and then mainly in the 1960s. Francois Truffaut, Jacques Rivette, Eric Romare, Claude Chabrol, and Godard were sort of the, the inner core of the French New Wave, and they revolutionized world filmmaking back in the 1960s. Uh, and their influence was on Hollywood and film all over the world. World. All the other of the French New Wave are now dead. Uh, Godard is the only one who's still alive, but he is still working and still making movies on a regular basis. His last movie, his last feature film before this one was a 3D film, of all things, from a man in his late 80s. And now we have the image book. The image book is not a movie for everybody. Uh, it is very typical of late Godard films. It is kaleidoscopic. Uh, it is a weave of film and video images on the screen, which moves along at a tremendous clip, just leaping from one image to another. Uh, the movie is called The Image Book, over the course of a little under an hour and a half. At the same time, on the soundtrack, there is an equally dense, equally rich, equally kaleidoscopic blend of sounds, and sometimes silence. There is music, there is lots and lots of narration, there is sound from some of the film and video clips that we are seeing as they cascade across the screen. So we have this tremendous image collage. We have this tremendous sound collage of word uh, and music and sound effect uh, that comes along. And both of these things play off each other, again, in this exceedingly kaleidoscopic way for almost an hour and a half. The subject... Uh, it has been said that the subject of the film is violence, and that very well may be true. Uh, a lot of Godard's movies, especially a lot of his late movies, deal very much with the subject of violence, uh, with which he has been very concerned throughout his career. Uh, he is fascinated and troubled by, in fact, really distressed by the violence of war, the violence that human beings inflict on one another, and how this is both mirrored and not mirrored in movies, the way movies seem to be absolutely overflowing, movies and television and all the moving images that we have, uh, overflowing with violence uh, and, and all kinds of horrors, sometimes in a meaningful way, such as documentaries that maybe help us to understand something about war and, and peace, uh, but very often in sensational spectacles. Uh, the Hollywood violence that often means nothing and just sort of deadens and brutalizes us. He's very, very concerned with these things. He's very, very concerned with the interplay between the image uh, and uh, on, on the screen and all, all, all the screens of our lives, from our phones to the gigantic movie screens, uh, with the interplay between those images and then the real life that actually goes on, and which is not a matter of images, but which is a matter of real human suffering and evil and destructiveness and so forth. So all these things are things that the image book is about. The image book is also, though, just a movie about movies, or I should say more broadly, a movie about moving images. Uh, it is on one level just a uh, spectacular audiovisual phenomenon, uh, which pretty much floods the senses uh, of sight and sound with so much material, it, it's really almost impossible to take it in on a single viewing. Uh, but then again, Godard has hoped for many, many years, he told me this once uh, when I interviewed him, uh, that he uh, he hopes people will see his movies more than once. Uh, you hear a Beethoven symphony for the first time, you don't say, well, okay, I got it. 
I got that symphony. Uh, no need to go back to that again. One rereads the great novels. He hopes that one will rewatch his films and that with each watching, a little bit more will become clear. A little more will reveal itself. And I think that's the way that the image book has to be taken. I will say, though, that even on one viewing, it will dazzle you. If you just want an eye-popping, ear-popping spectacle of sheer magnificent movement and form and shape and color and sound, then go and see the image book and see it on a nice big screen because it's just a spectacular creation by – it's basically a collage of sight and sound but done by the world's greatest living master uh, of that sort of cinema. And this has got to be one of the finest works that he's ever created. Again, it is cryptic. It is enigmatic. It is dark and hard to figure out, but it is a true treat for the eyes and the ears. And that is my somewhat kaleidoscopic story this week, Jill. Very good with the kaleidoscope. Thank you very much, David Sterrett. Films in Focus, the films Leaving Neverland, The Wild Pear Tree, and The Image Book. (laughs) ¶¶ 